Good evening and welcome to tonight's HDB Cereals and Oil Seeds webinar uh, focusing on crop nutrition. My name is Richard Meredith. I'm the Knowledge Exchange Manager for the West of England and Wales and I'll be chairing your webinar this evening. Um, for those of you that have been to a webinar before or joined into a webinar before, I'm um, just going to run through the housekeeping points. Um, you are all muted, don't worry, we can't hear or see you. Um, there's a question box on the right hand side of your screen. If you have any questions as we go through the webinar, they are welcomed um, and I can manage those as they come in. Uh, please feel free to, to ask them. And we're looking to, to aim to conclude around the eight o'clock point, depending on how many, any, how many questions we receive. Um, but um, that's not, not entirely fixed. We'll see how we get on. Um, there is a, a formal questions um, and answer period at the end if you have anything you want to ask then, um, that which, which strays away from what we've been discussing. Um, if you would like to have a recording of the, the webinar, tonight's webinar, um, in the next couple of days, it will go up onto the AHDB YouTube um, site. So please look out for that. There are basis and Neuroso points available. If you're registered for either, either of those, you can either email them to myself, Richard Meredith, you would have received the email for invitations from me, or you can write them in the questions box of the, of the webinar, and I'll register those and send them off for you. So tonight's webinar, just to set the scene, we're sat in um, the HDB York office. I'm sat with our two speakers tonight, Pete Berry and David Bell. <laughs> this is their, their first first experience with a webinar, so we'll, we'll see how we get on. They look they look relaxed and ready to go for for an exciting evening. I'm really looking forward to our discussion, David, uh, about uh, all things crop production. Good stuff. Um, I suppose with inputs. Um, getting the most out of them. Um, Fertiliser is the, the largest input and uh, kind of looking at uh, nitrogen uh, and the, the break-even ratio. Um, you know, Scotland has been updated now to be more in line with uh, the rest of the UK to five to one ratio. Um, I try and purchase my uh, fertiliser when it's uh, at its cheapest and I can sell my wheat at the same time at its, uh, its largest on the graph uh, to try and get that, uh, that better margin. But um, you know, what's your views on the ratio? Well, it's important to take account of the break-even ratio, but the standard is, is five to one. Um, and it does vary, obviously, each year, depending on the price of the grain that you sell out and the cost of the fertilizer. But it has to vary quite a lot to justify uh, changing your fertilizer rates significantly. Um, but with the volatility of grain prices, it could change quite a lot in some seasons. So it's it's worth checking it uh, if you have a, a big swing in, in grain prices or fertilizer costs. And the RB209 gives you a little table which describes how you need to change your fertilizer rates uh, in light of big changes in the break-even ratio. Yeah, I mean, I'd say it's that and, and also I get great uh, use of the, uh, the market intelligence from uh, HDB, the quarterly uh, fertilizer. Uh, I think it's now uh, they just got a link on the email rather than the, 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 uh, and the document. But uh, it's, uh, it's good having an insight into where the, the fertilizer market's going with uh, world trends hmm. um, for, for knowing when to purchase. But like with selling my wheat, uh, you know, I, I do it with a, an averaging, buying my fertilizer, buying my inputs, you, you, you make an average uh, when you're buying stuff in and uh, you make your average when you're, you're selling, you're never going to hit the highs, but hopefully you don't hit the lows yeah. when, when selling and uh, reverse when you're, Certainly. Uh, yeah. when you're buying. So, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. the plan anyway. Yeah. Um, so this year, David, it was a, a challenging spring, wasn't it? Um, with it being so cold and wet in March. How did that affect the way you supplied your crops with their nutrients? Yeah, it was uh, a real challenge with the, the Cold mist and uh, getting on the ground. I mean, um, we're a, we're a plow based system. Uh, so all you zero tillers will be in, uh, gassed. But uh, yeah, we're a plow system. So um, with that came its own challenges with uh, with the softer ground, uh, wetter ground for for getting transport across it. Um, when it uh, some some neighbours went uh, before the east from the east hit. Um, we were in the middle of the red zone at that time. Uh, I was currently lambing, um, which wasn't much fun. But um, yeah, we were. Uh, somebody was gone early with N, which possibly washed off 
um, with that um, with that weather, but um, we we weren't as uh, quick off the mark, and uh, we could only apply once the ground had dried up. In turn, it uh, it seemed to seemed to work out all right, and um, for the majority of our of our uh, ground, um, that it was a challenge. And again, there was the suspected uh, as the summer went on and the drought became more uh, prolonged. Uh, there was, uh, I think, reduced air uptake and um, quite damage to, to crops, especially potatoes, uh, where really fresh produce was uh, struggling to, to cope with the, the lack of moisture and the lack of availability of the of the uh, nutrients to get to the crop uh, because of lack of moisture. Mm. Um, and then, uh, I mean, coming to harvest, uh, yeah, that was fairly evident in in some of the lighter ground, which didn't have the, the such good uh, organic content uh, for moisture retention. So the marginal ground, um, so it didn't have uh, didn't have the availability of nutrients. Yeah, yeah. So you, you got some pretty decent uh, wheat yields typically. Um, what sort of nitrogen rates do you use for your wheat, and and do you adjust them in light of what the potential yield is? So uh, I think you're being very generous with that uh, comment. But, uh, yeah, we so we farm in a MVZ. Um, Fife uh, is a, or the east of Fife is a is a MVZ area which uh, which uh, it comes with its challenges. But if you can prove your yield um, with a rolling five year average, I think it is, um, uh, you you can justify applications. Um, a lot of our ground is marginal, and uh, yes, we saw some of our record yields this year uh, on uh, high yields, but we also saw some of our record low yields, um, and the the variability within fields was was quite substantial. Um, some of them from uh, one ton a hectare of wheat uh, to nine ton within the same field. Um, um, but uh, yeah, we we've all seen the variability this year. Um, and it comes with its challenges. Um, we do vary our our in application to an extent, um, knowing the knowing the nutrient makeup of the ground. Um, for example, some contract grounds that we, we've taken on um, is known to be low in pH, uh, so it's, it will have a less uh, effectiveness of N uptake. Um, so, although possibly not uh, quite so cost effective. Uh, will increase increase the end slightly to make up for that. Um, we vary our uh, end application because we are using some uh, urea in some of our makeup uh, of uh, of uh, end delivery. Um, so uh, we'll, if we're using for each urea, we'll probably put up about ten percent um, with the uh, assumed uh, loss uh, upwards. Um, but yeah, um, different ground can cope with different uh, and has different potential. Um, our sandy, our beach sand, our, our ground, it does not have the same potential as our, our uh, other mineral soils and our, our glaze. So um, it doesn't have the same body to, yeah. to keep the yeah. nutrients and moisture retention. Yeah. So it sounds like you 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 adjust the end rate in light of the type of crop and the soil that you've got as much as possible. Then yeah, yeah. Because yeah. as as most will be aware on. Um, we the RB two and I was updated to account for differences in expected yields, such for for every extra ton of yield for wheat above eight tons per hectare, an extra twenty kilograms of N per hectare is justified. And the reason we did that, if you look at the slide we uh, just put up now, um, we were finding that over years the N rate has stayed exactly the same for many years. The yield was. Uh, although variable, it was increasing gradually, um, but the grain protein was de decreasing, and it was telling us that uh, because the breeders were improving yield, for example, uh, nitrogen rate was the same, but the concentration of nitrogen in the grain was going down, telling us that for some of these crops, they weren't being fertilized enough. And when we looked more closely at this for, for example, barley, we were seeing that there was a a positive relationship between the yield at the optimum nitrogen rate and the difference between what RB209 recommended for a standard, for example, in this case, barley, a seven ton yield, and what the measured optimum end rate was. So it was telling us that basically for the 
high yielding crops, they needed more nitrogen and, and the RB209 was adapted accordingly to account for that. But but as, as, as David says, you, you can't just uh, ch make that change um, any any time. You've got to think about the structure of the soil. Uh, is, is the in expected yield justified to be high? You need to account for all the sort of agronomic factors which come into play there. David, what do you think you'll do going forward if you're no longer able to use urea? Um, use a mm -hmm. Um Pretty straightforward. Um, I, I take it that sort of uh, it refers to the, the new uh, environmental uh, suggestions uh, coming forward. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, well, I'll, I'll turn it around and ask Pete, you, you know, the perceived benefits is, is it clever marketing or is it is it is it actually true that uh, you know you get a better um crop uptake yeah um from an over urea yeah we did lots of experiments on ammonia emissions uh, in urea and ammonium nitrate we had these little mini wind tunnels we put uh, over our plots which measured the ammonia gas which came off after applying the fertilizer and it showed us that urea on average emitted about 20% of its N applied as ammonia. So volatilization calls those ammonia emissions. So quite a substantial amount of nitrogen is lost in untreated urea. It could be anything from 10% up to over 30% in some cases. And the result of that was that in order to achieve the same yield with urea, you needed to apply an extra 10% of nitrogen to match the yield achieved uh, by with ammonium nitrate but the good news is that if you treat the urea with urease inhibitors then it uh, dramatically improves its uptake efficiency and i think david that's that's yeah, what you're doing i i uh, previously was a urea based system uh, some some uh, one year in particular i, I did my my complete uh, n requirement was through urea uh, for winter cereals anyway um, and uh, the, the, uh, the refer to the winter cereals there because the perceived, uh, especially north of the border, the if you're using urea on the spring barley for a low end market, um, for a malting barley, uh, there's a, a worry that the nitrogen, uh, because it's slower release urea, it gets into the grain uh, too late in the season, so you get high high grain end. So that's why we kept uh, to urea, but but no, um, and we've moved away from a urea based. Uh, N uh, and UAN through liquid, but um, yeah, the, there was the, the fear that uh, we weren't getting the, as much N as, as we wanted out of the urea for the for the growing crop, so we went for a more um, uh, controllable uh, form mm. of nitrogen with uh, ammonium nitrate. Yeah, I mean, and with with within that as well, uh, bringing compounds so that we had a. a an and s in the same same granule granule which uh, again uh, I, I, yes it's a premium product um but hopefully that uh, that insurance kind of pays off for itself and you know you, the plant has the the correct uh, uh nutrient layer for it pete got a question here from um richard payne the taunton lawn farmer um he says uan is that less volatilization um it's a bit a bit less, but he's still getting volatilization with it, but it's not as much as as straight urea. Thank you. Yeah. So one of the I've I've just started using uh, liquid and some UAN as well, uh, and and rolling forward with it. Um, uh, and uh, one of the, the the selling points to me, apart from it being liquid, um, and using the whole, whole field and whole crop right to the edge rather than the, the tail off of um, trajectory for granular application was the, the UAN. So you get the ammonium nitrate um, quick fix for the crop, but also you get the, the prolonged urea effect, um, which is uh, what we wanted to try. It, it, it sounds on paper anyway, yep. uh, that it's the, the right way to go. Yeah. For, for, the, for the growing crop, um, a little and often approach rather than a all at once. Yeah, yeah. So David, how do you manage the sort of risk of scorch with the liquid applications? Uh, just do it when it's not windy. <laughs> yep. Yep. Um, uh, but um, yeah, uh, also as I understand, uh, modern liquid farts are uh, a lot more kinder to the plant 
than they used to be, and um, so they're a, a lot more forgiving. Um, but the uh, same as any application um, of any product, uh, good husbandry, uh, mm. good driver, uh, operator skill um, is paramount. You know, you're, you're spending a lot of money on these products to put onto your your uh, uh, what you make profit from. Yeah. Um, so you do it right. Yeah. Um, you know, you, with the introduction of uh, sprayer MOTs um, uh, and and uh, spreader uh, assessments. Yeah. You know, the, it's a no-brainer. Mm. You know, make sure these this equipment is is running properly. Yep. Yep. Um, to, to to get the best from it. And and how many splits would you normally use on your wheat? Um, yeah, it, it, it ranges. Um, the the multiple approaches of N. Uh, through granulars, through liquids, through, through compounds, uh, it does give flexibility. Um, it, it, uh, so that a prime example was this spring when it was wet and cold and we couldn't get on the ground and we thought we needed a, a quicker fix. So we changed the, the um, AN first and some, some uh, UAN as well through liquid and uh, to, to combat the needs of the growing crop. Um, um, it, to put a urea first would have been, in our eyes, the, the wrong idea because the, the plant needs something quicker than that to, to, to get going. Um, but uh, we, we kind of follow the, the growth guide um, that uh, the, the HDB do for the wheat, and it has uh, specific benchmarks for uh, for hit growth stages yep. for yep. the uh, for the growing crop. Yep. Um, for N, and we try and factor our uh, our uh, N requirements around them. Yeah. Yeah. One of the areas in, in the yield enhancement network, for example, is to investigate whether multiple N applications, little and often, can be helpful. And the, the, the hypothesis behind that is that uh, nitrogen uptake efficiency averages only 60%. So it's not, we, there's a lot of scope for improvement. And one of the main reasons for the sort of low uptake efficiency is that the nitrogen can be immobilized by the soil bugs before the crop can get to it. So if you apply little and often, and you're matching the applications with the demand of the crop, then in theory, you could minimize that immobilization by the soil bugs uh, and improve uptake efficiency. That's still to be proven, but uh, there's a few growers trying that idea out. I think it, it makes complete sense um, on, on paper um, that uh, you're not stressing the plant with giving it all the or, or not all, but a large chunk of nutrient at, at one time. And um, similar with a, a hot tank mix for chemicals. You know, if you're giving uh, a lot of, uh, you know, it stresses the plant, it, it stunts it a little bit. And uh, I think it, it, it's 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 possibly not proven, but uh, with with nutrition as well, if you give a, a large chunks of nutrition at once, the the plant uh, may may get some stress from that as well. Um, but uh, the, the troubles with uh, with paper and practice is that uh, when you've got fields to get spread, it's uh, very time consuming to do multiple mm. uh, multiple applications. Yeah. So we have to have that balance of the right uh, nutrition at the right time, but in a usable form of, of logistics. Um, and uh, none of us seem to have uh, much time um, to to, to mm. uh, do other things. So so yeah. Um, there is that uh, that balance. Pete, I've got one more question before we move on. In your opinion, I have to stress in your opinion, um, how much does the temperature on the day day of and day after the application of urea affect the amount of volatilization? Well, a lot, a huge amount. Um, the, the sort of main factors which affect the amount of volatilization are uh, the moisture content and the, and the, and the temperature. Uh, also, if you can shallow cultivate um, straight after a applying the urea that will help to minimize volatilization but temperature is a biggie and and that range we saw in our little wind tunnels of 10 to 30 percent of end volatilized a lot of that would have been down to the, the temperature yeah we find that um we're fortunate enough to have uh, waste cells on our, our fertilizer spreaders for uh, on the move calibration uh, and uh, uh, variable rate when when required but um even at flat rate spreading the um the weight of the fertilizer through the throughout the day changes um uh, as the temperature increases or decreases mm. um it's noticeably the different uh, the rate to apply the same amount mm. um uh, mm. yeah it's quite it, yeah with, with the introduction of the waste cells it, 
it really has uh, mm. highlighted that to us. Yeah. Really. yeah. Thank you. So, so David, you have a sort of big nutrient to phosphorus. Um, do you have like a, a general farm policy with delivering the phosphorus needs of a plant? Yeah. So, so we're a, we're potatoes are, a, are a, a, another uh, uh, primary enterprise uh, of with ourselves. So we want to hide, have a good, good uh, medium statuses, um, depending on which system you use, uh, a medium to high or medium to positive or a two plus. Uh, for potatoes, uh, they're, they're a lot uh, slower with the uptake of pea, um, as uh, there's some research that going on. Um, as I say, tongue in cheek, with <laughs> uh, that uh, you know, you, you're, the arable farmers are, are trying to maintain a, a one status of pea, and quite rightly, if it's just arable. But as a potato producer who has to rent in ground, uh, it's uh, quite challenging thinking that I might have to get ground that's. Uh, of lower lower status but yeah so we, we try and uh try and do that but also we have the fym we have the grass in, in some of our rotation in our own controlled ground and um, so we, we're, we're very fortunate uh, and we are fortunate to have uh, some good uh, some good statuses um so we're just maintaining that um we're, we're using it different uh, forms of pea we, we, we were bagged pea um but now we're we're uh, going to these uh, organic uh, like burnt fiber uh, burnt uh, hen pen um, which doesn't have a nitrogen, but it's got uh, naturally occurring P and K, S, and some trace, um, and it's perceived that, that has a, a slower, uh, slower um, availability to the growing crop. But because our status is higher, um, we have that um, that uh, ability to 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 there for the growing crop. Yep. Yep. Yes, because one of the, the project, uh, the AHDB funded project ongoing at the moment, one of its strap lines is how can we better feed the crop rather than the soil with the phosphorus? Because we know that once you apply phosphorus to the soil, it can quite easily be locked up and, and not be available to the plant. So we've been looking at ways of uh, improving the uptake efficiency of the phosphorus fertilizer by the plant, uh, such as uh, using fresh phosphorus or, or uh, placing it close to the seed. Do you do anything with placement, David? Um, no, we don't do any placement. Um, we're, I mean, it's, we're quite fortunate again because of our higher statuses. Um, the uh, we're there, there is not a perceived benefit, uh, although it's not tested, and uh, there's not perceived benefit of the of the placement because uh, the P is. Uh, more freely available, readily mm. available to mm. the growing mm. crop. Um, um, the, the, I mean, the, the, the researcher put up just now uh, mm. P index one, uh, so we're we're two if not three. Um, so uh, yes, uh, a very luxurious position to be in. Um, but yeah, the effect of placement has uh, has a lesser effect, I think, on uh, on our shelves. That's right. I can well believe that. You know where. The work we did was mainly on uh, soils of P and C zero and one, and we looked at using fresh phosphate and also placed and the fresh phosphate increased yield of, of spring barley. And we move on to the next slide, the winter barley here as well. Uh, but the yield was increased again more if it was placed next to the seed. So there's an obvious advantage in those sort of situations yeah, for um, when, I, when I'm using uh, my bulk organics for like potato I, I use a, a good uh, FYM uh, dosing of, uh, of, the, of the ground before it's uh, ploughed in um, with FYM and you take that into account that the bulk organics are, are not so readily available uh, yep. to the growing crop um, I, th I think it's uh, I want to say 60% um, available for uh, for K and uh, 40 odd for p mm. possibly or the other way around uh, off the top of my head but um yeah so we take that into account and and that benefit of the fym has uh, has helped our margins on the potato enterprise because we're not over applying uh bag fertilizer in, in placement yep. uh, for the potato plant yep um but yeah um zero wise no no we don't have we have that luxury of having high status mm. yeah pete i've got a few questions coming in here so we'll have a quick quick ask them now. Um, first of all, any comments on TSB being bad for the soil um, the microbiology and such? Hmm. We haven't uh, assessed that. So I haven't heard of anybody sort of 
saying much about that, so I can't really comment on that, I'm afraid. Um, any difference between TSP and DAP in this situation? Uh, yeah, it's difficult to disentangle the two because you've obviously got nitrogen in, in the DAP as well. Um, uh, we haven't done the direct tests, to be honest, between DAP and TSP. Right. <laughs> Sorry, it's a bit of a longer one. There's lots of work done in the 80s and 90s which showed little or no difference to nitrogen uptake. <clears throat> Certainly not statistically significant between urea and ammonium nitrate. Yep. I remember ARC found no real issue. Do you feel that has all been proved wrong? It's not proven wrong. I mean, when we our work in the well, it's the two thousands now that there were lots of trials which showed that um, urea and ammonium nitrate were equivalent. Um, and when the when the conditions for applying urea uh, are good, particularly low temperatures, um, particularly rainfall soon after application, then urea could be as good as ammonium nitrate and. Um, we have a large number of trials which which show that, but there are a sort of substantial minority of trials which show quite a big difference between ammonium nitrate and urea as well. So it's it's um, when so you count for those as well, the average shows that uh, the urea is slightly inferior. Final final one. Um, after potatoes, we we always have the highest yield of wheat, no matter how much we try to push wheat drilled earlier after winter oil seed rate. Is that due to nitrogen availability or, or to other nutrients availability when the crop is drilled in early November? Um, this particular person is farming on deep silts. What do you think? What's your opinion on that? Could it be down to your pea? You know, the potatoes are, are very uh, poor in their pea uptake, so we have to apply more than the growing crop needs uh, of pea. So it, it may not just be the, the break crop effect, but maybe the residual pea left over by the potato crop as well. It could, yes. Um, and in in the yield enhancement network analysis we did, we did find um, that phosphate uh, was associated with some of the higher yields. So that could be the answer, David. Yeah. Is the placing of phosphate cost effective, Pete? Um, like for example, does the extra yield cover the cost of placing, say, compared to broadcast broadcasting compound? What's your index? What do you think? What's your index? You know, as as if your index zero. I'm sure you'll agree with the placement would be great. You'll see huge benefits or, or benefits anyway. Uh, but if you've got good statuses and, and healthy statuses, healthy soils, although that's a controversial topic, what is a healthy soil? You know, if you've got good statuses or a higher statuses, you'll say, let's not be good or bad, let's be uh, higher statuses, um, placement would be cost effective. Yes, yeah, so and I'd add to that that the largest advantages from placement we found uh, not just on the naught and one indices but also with potatoes and barley when we looked at placement with wheat and also rape the advantages were nowhere near as great uh, on those low indice um, soils so the biggest advantages were definitely barley and, and potatoes thank you Pete. i'll leave i'll leave you in peace for a minute <laughs> okay um so I think we've probably done on the, on the phosphorus uh, side of things now, David. So perhaps it's worth just having a, a think about the 2018 season and uh, and how that went for you with, with the challenges generally and, and the sort of yields you did achieve. Yeah, as, as we touched on earlier, um, it has been a, uh, a challenge season. And yes, we got our, our, um, our record uh, lows and, and record highs and the variability of infields. Um, it's helping to helping us see we're moving towards um, variable rate drilling as well. So we'll have the right population of, of growing plant in the in the right uh, soil soil uh, parts of the field, which uh, should help um, lessen the variability to an extent um, and uh, have a bit more uniformity harvest wise, but also nutrient uptake wise uh, or availability of the of the of the ground. Um, Going with the, the, the what the, really did highlight the variability was where we have uh, grass and livestock rotations um, on on some of the, the heavier ground compared to the lighter marginal grounds where uh, it's not solely under our control. Um, 
uh, you know, the the yes, it was a, a first year out of grass on a livestock farm, and uh, we had a field average of, of 13.7, and it was it, we've never seen a yield like that uh, before. It wasn't overly pushed. Um, uh, wish it was in yen. Uh, didn't didn't uh, didn't uh, think of that at the time. Um, <laughs> but uh, but yeah, it was um, it was astounding. Uh, but again, we had a, a opposite of that on, on sandy ground down near the coast, uh, proper marginal ground. Uh, we had a, a field average of, of 4.7, um, which is uh, the, the contrast in, in the same growing season with with very little difference in uh, agronomy uh, between the two. Um, it, it highlights it. Yeah. Um, That's it's, a sort of... it's, it's knowing your knowing your fields, and as every uh, farmer or, or producer or grower uh, mm. should. should yeah, precision. It's a sort of a similar experience that we found big variation, much of it due to water retentiveness of the soil and the rooting depth, particularly. Do you, do you ever get out and measure the rooting depth in your in your crops? Not as much as I should, um, but uh, it's quite hard work. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, um, yeah, I mean, we're quite fortunate. We, we um, compaction has been a. a, a something I, I, we have wanted to, to lessen um, we're fortunate because we have uh, livestock and fresh produce so we, we have a quite a good team uh, and quite maybe uh, for our for our area we have uh, a high a high team uh, a number of staff and um, so we have smaller equipment but possibly more of it and um, smaller weight or lesser weight going over the ground um, our operational windows uh, are then uh, increased because we don't sink as much. Uh, we oversize the potato, the tires, so we try to get maximum footprint. Uh, we split the combine of tracks. We um, oversize flotation tires on grain trailers. Um, all these little things to uh, marginal gain mm. uh, yep. to try and uh, lessen the effect of of of, uh, of, of the compaction. For example, even potatoes for the following year, you know, potatoes, a lot of kit goes over the ground, especially the headlands. So we plant the headlands in, in a clover or a deep tapping root yep. to try and minimize compaction. Um, and it also increase, it has a break crop there as well for the following year. But we, we see huge benefits of, uh, of that, uh, of that uh, crop, not necessarily for improving the ground, but for uh, reducing the potential impact of the compaction mm. um, um, to, for helping rooting. But, you know, we have a, a, a varying, uh, we vary the, the plow depth each year, so you're not always going at the same depth and creating pans uh, year on year. Um, this year has been a, a dream for, for most of us in the sense of uh, Mother Nature doing the majority of subsoiling. Um, so, yeah, we take all these factors into account. Yeah. Um, no, so it sounds very impressive. Yeah, I mean, we're we're encouraging farmers to to do more soil pits if they can, and see how deep the roots are going. Um, I, ideally, they should be able to get down to two meters in in the autumn. Roots can grow at a rate of twelve I millimeters a day. Soil. No, and a lot of people <laughs> haven't got that. No, that's right. Um, and, if, and if they could, you know, they would extract a tremendous amount of water and have a tremendous yield potential. Uh, when we did a survey a few years ago, we found that on average most wheat crops that there wasn't enough roots below just 40 centimeters depth so there's plenty of scope to improve rooting depth mm -hmm. but no and we also with that we, because of our uh, varying soil types and textures we, we try and vary uh, the cultivations accordingly um uh, sand can be horrendously power sapping um but why 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 invert it when um, uh, there's no need to, so we uh, we do lesser uh, cultivations um, in in the areas that don't need it. Uh, the heavier ground, um, arguably, in, in our in our current practice, it needs inversion. Um, others may disagree. Um, yeah, that's a luxury to have mm. uh, that capital tied up in multiple seed drills. Yeah. Um, but um, but yeah. Um, While we're on the topic of cultivations, one of the things from our yen analysis was that um, there was an association between narrower row whips in wheat and higher yields, which 
what we found was quite interesting. Yeah, I was surprised by that as well. The the general assumption going forward by manufacturers anyway mm. is wider, you know, wider spaces yeah. more light getting into the crop. Yeah. Um, but the I suppose the the counter to that is the closer not uh, closer rows, closer drilling, and more competition. So they want to fight for the fight for the space possibly. Um, that's that's right. I mean, I do think there is a disconnect between the sort of physiology of the crop and the some of the machinery manufacturers in that by having a wider row it might make it easier to to establish the crop but it takes longer for that crop to capture all the light coming in because it takes longer to get full canopy closure and i think that could be the reason why the wider rows were associated with with, with lower yields uh, yeah, it's, it's interesting, uh, different cultivation or drilling techniques as well with the reduced tillage, zero tillage uh, drills um, mm. for sometimes require, uh, because of the, um, the placement, require wider spacing as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, interesting. Yeah, yeah. So we've, we've talked about wheat a lot, but you, you, you grow spring barley as yep. well as, uh, as an important crop. Spring barley for the, the Scottish national drink. Yeah, um, indeed. <laughs> good, good, uh, good malting barley. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm uh, quite happy to do that. And uh, if we can quickly uh, take a side note and click to another slide uh, for RL, uh, I also sit on the um, HDB recommended list for barley notes, um, and there's an advert uh, somewhere oh. for it uh, that we forgot to do it earlier. Um, we're currently uh, looking for growers, agronomists, and pathologists to join the RL. Um, there's uh, there's uh, openings on the wheat, the barley notes, uh, and rye and oilseed rape uh, committees, mm. um, and we we are um, very keen to get uh, be myself a grower anyway uh, involved. The I think it's great. Um, you have a chance to to influence industry, influence the the, the direction that the growers and the breeders are taking crops. Um, uh, you want to be part of it. If you have an opinion, you know, don't just shout about it. Be involved. Engage with uh, mm -hmm. with where your levy is going to, and uh, and help uh, help the the sector uh, flourish and uh, move forward in in what will be some pretty challenging times. Um, so, yeah, because yeah, I do feel, particularly on spring barley, that you can get both quality and yield now with the new varieties. Yeah, um, there's there's some fantastic uh, yields uh, coming coming out of the spring barley's. Um, the the um, it's questionable whether you you have uh, feed specific because some of these malting spring mm. barley's uh, have high enough yield to to grow them for malting, and if they don't meet malting spec, they you still got a, a barn filler for uh, for feed. Um, but uh, yeah, some some good some good genetics and breeding coming through. So going back to the nutrition topic, mm. um, what's your what's the grain specification you need to hit so for the spring to, barley? Uh, have low low grain N, yeah, uh, under one point six five. Yep. Um, which uh, so it's uh, we put all our uh, N requirements on uh, before the or generally before if we can before the plants through the ground. Okay. Uh, right. on, on when it was a when it's a broadcast system. Bear in mind, we're slightly lower, later drilling than down south yeah. um, by by uh, uh, a good uh, good few weeks. Okay. Um, but uh, yeah, so we're uh, probably putting on uh, about uh, 125, 130 kilos of of N for spring barley. Uh, now that the genetics of the of the crop, the high yielding varieties, can withstand that because of their higher yield. They uh, they can disperse the nitrogen through the growing crop uh, better. Previous to that, we were we we're down in the high high teens, uh, 118, 120, um, but kind of pushed it. Uh, it's a fine line to 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 maximise yield, but uh, lessen or lower the the green end. Yeah. Um, uh, so uh, so yeah, it's quite a, quite a challenge sometimes in variable ground as well. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we're managing a. AHDB project at the moment to update the spring barley nitrogen and sulfur guidelines hmm. and certainly this year the um, if you didn't put any nitrogen on in the seedbed then uh, the yield was quite severely reduced but you need to re recognize that in previous years um, putting on 
a substantial amount of nitrogen in the seedbed where we had a lot of soil mineral land already there and quite a lodging prone site uh, it was also quite detrimental so we, we we sort of it's only the first year of our project but we're thinking really we need a more nuanced um, approach to timing of nitrogen fertilizer for spring barley you know where you are david it's very sensible to do your approach in other situations where you've got large amounts of nitrogen already in the soil and a, and a lodging prone site then a, a different strategy might pay more yeah, dividends it's knowing your rotation uh, and also knowing your your soil nitrogen supply and yeah. uh, and, and how that works together um it's, a, um, it's quite interesting we, we always talk about nitrogen this nitrogen that but it's also the sulfur uh, to make the nitrogen work and that that's often gets uh, forgotten about that you need to have the correct ratio of nitrogen to sulfur uh, 1 to 15 for cereals anyway uh, or 15 to 1 should you say yep um that uh to make it work and uh yeah especially especially up, up further north you go with the air is cleaner and it's a lot healthier <laughs> and uh, better for you uh, uh, so we, uh, we need to apply a lot more sulfur than, uh, than uh, yeah than well you're right <laughs> in my opinion yeah. atmospheric <laughs> depositions of sulfur now are pretty negligible so you, you're right and, and one of the experiments we did last year there was a yield response of more than one ton per hectare to applying sulfur so some pretty large yield improvements can be had, certainly. Yeah. Yeah. So I uh, know that it's interesting work, and uh, I, I'm fortunate to, and very fortunate to sit on the research and knowledge exchange committee as well, um, uh, as a farmer, uh, to 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 ask layman layman questions to all all the researchers and all the scientists, and uh, it's great that the the levy is going towards some some good research, mm. um, uh, as well. Yeah. Pete, I've got a couple of questions here. It's going back to phosphate, so we'll get them ticked off before we move on. Um, first of all, if a tissue test at T1 or slash T2 shows a phosphate deficiency, what are your options at this point? Is it too late for fresh or foliar options? Well, it's too late for fresh, um, but it's possibly not too late for foliar P. You know, I think there's, there's still, there's very little research on the benefits of foliar P, but um, there's enough to suggest that it could be useful. Um, so it's worth giving that a try. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm quite excited this year. We're, uh, we're going to do some, uh, some, some field scales on two, two of our barley crops, uh, a spring barley and a winter feeding barley, um, of tissue testing through the season and, uh, mm. and apply it. And, uh, it's, uh, I'm quite looking forward to the, to, to seeing how, how the, how the plant up, takes it up the nutrients and, and requires. Uh, yeah. 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 Uh, another question: What soil temperature and percentage moisture content is needed for root growth to be 12, 12 mil per day? At what point does this growth stop? And um, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm just smiling at that because uh, my present to myself last year was a, a thermometer <laughs> uh, before, before I uh, went around spreading because uh, there's no point. Or there's there's less point putting uh, putting uh, fertilizer on the ground when it's too cold for any use and it, it risks runoff uh, on the soil without uh, being used. Um, so uh, I went prodding around the fields to, to get uh, temperatures um, to, to to do. Brilliant. Spread. Well done. <laughs> you need to get a hobby. <laughs> <laughs> what, what's your opinion, Pete? Um, yeah, I mean, the, the 12 millimetres a day was sort of uh, October time. So, you know, the soil temperatures are going to be 12, 13 degrees um, around that time. And, and below about six degrees, you, you're not going to get very much root growth at all. So you sort of get a linear linear effect of temperature on root growth between those those temperatures. TSP, TSP application timing. What is your opinion? What is best for the crop versus the environment it's the timing well we're trying to sort of well there's two there's two approaches to to using the phosphate and the most common approach and the one recommended by rb2 at the moment is to um apply phosphate rotationally to build up the soil indices to the um target indices depending on your rotation um so applying it you know, traditionally in, in the autumn, um, when there's quite a long period before any sort of surface runoff is likely or, or um, 
large amounts of rainfall is 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 the most sort of safest option environmentally. Um, our more recent work has been showing that where you've got low p indices of zero and one, then fresh p in in the in the spring when the crop's growing uh, can pay dividends as well for crop growth. Um, so so there's a sort of a tool two schools of thought but I, you know i think at the moment we need to stick with the current rb209 school of thought of uh, targeting our target soil indices and applying the phosphate rotationally to achieve those thank you so for me for the moment so we've covered two of your main crops winter wheat and uh, spring barley david um potatoes your other yeah big one aren't they potatoes and grass grass is uh, my probably my largest area crop okay but, uh, but no potatoes uh yep go for it so in terms of what do you see as the most important nutrient to get right for your potatoes and um, because uh, potatoes are such a high margin crop uh, as as all fresh produce is and um, in the horticulture or potato sectors um yeah uh, there's no uh there's no one thing that is less crucial than the other uh, because it's uh, you, you don't want to be uh, losing out on this. Um, yeah, there's there's great work being done by spot farms, um, especially up uh, the, uh, the the legal spot farm with uh, Bruce Farms. Uh, they've done some great work and they've shown the reduced N uh, has increased uh, potato yield, um, which uh, it goes against uh, common perception mm. uh, um, and uh, also improved quality which with fresh produce is it's, it's uh, saleable yield and uh, saleable quality um, so so yeah i've been i i'm i, I religiously follow my um, variety guides mm. for uh, for n uh, application yeah uh, i have various spreadsheets for working out my fym content yeah and um, for for getting the right uh, n uh, and P and K balance yep. in, in the green crop, yep. and we we part um, part broadcast um, onto the plow as well as placement, um, so we get uh, the whole the whole profile of the growing bed or the growing drill is uh, has nutrient in it for the for the very poor rooting potato yep. as a plant. Yep. Potatoes are very poor yep. rooting. Yeah. Um, so so mm. yeah, and and yeah, it's uh, it's uh, knowing knowing these things and educating yourself. Um, I was uh, I put myself through facts um, a few years back because uh, you get all the salesmen coming in telling you what to do uh, or what you should buy, but they're trying to also sell your product. So it's been hugely beneficial beneficial to our farming business to actually have that knowledge or or have that at least know what they're talking about when they do try to come in and sell you stuff. Mm. Uh, it's always good fun to sell someone they're wrong. Uh, when they're trying to sell your product but um but yeah it's um you still need the advice um but yeah it's the balance pete if we're going through the crops then obviously david doesn't grow all the seed rate but have you got any any comments on that from the from the past year gone by yes i mean average all seed rate yield last year was above average uh, which may surprise people given the sort of challenge of a year but the main reason for that was that uh, we had a good establishment, warm autumn, sort of roots able to grow quite effectively during that autumn. Um, we then had that cold spring, but that wasn't necessarily a bad thing for all sea rape. It managed back some of the large canopies. Um, and then we were followed by a particularly sunny um, May, which would have helped to set lots of seeds. So we ended up with quite optimum sized canopies, lots of sun, which helped to uh, set lots of seeds so we had a really good yield potential going into the seed filling period and then um, either the crops uh, had enough water and moisture in the soil to see them through till um, middle of July which is when most of them senesced or on the lighter soil shallow soils they didn't and they and they struggled and uh, yields were below average um, for those crops, but there were some very high yielding crops in, in the yield enhancement network. We had two or three crops which uh, were above six tonnes per hectare, uh, even in this year. So the, the message was great yield potential, but uh, 
only in a you know a, a few crops was it fully realized thank you and and david you know just generally thinking about yields if you were if you were trying to get a maximize yield what do you see as the most important factors to to get right if you're thinking generally about cereals let's say well there's the, the three components that make up yield as far as i'm aware is uh is sunlight um moisture and nutrients uh in, in the three bits and uh without one it kind of falls to bits like a triangle yeah yeah um i i i worry about the stuff i can control yeah uh, easier said than done um you know, you, you can't uh, you can't tell Mother Nature what you want, or you can tell her what you want you want, but she's not going to take much notice of you. And <laughs> um, so you, uh, you 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 manage what you can what you can you do yourself. Um, yes, I, I'm I'm fairly fortunate in some of my ground to have uh, high organic matter, um, resulting in in good uh, good moisture retention. Uh, it's very forgiving ground. Uh, other other parts are. Uh, very little OM, very sandy. Uh, again, it's forgiving in other ways. You, you can't really compact it because it's uh, mm. there's there's no there's no structure to it. Yeah. Um. Yeah. My the biggest thing to look after is pH. It always comes back to pH. Get your pH in the right place. Um. And every other nutrient works. Yeah. Uh, works its way from there. Um. It, it's amazing. So going into some of the contract, uh, taking on new contract ground. And uh, and when you convince you, the, the landowner to, to get some variable rate mapping done, uh, it just pays for itself. It's yeah, a, it's a no brainer. Yeah, right. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, and then then your 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 nitrogen uptake is is vastly improved as you go up to your to your optimum pH level. Same with your your P and and uh, a bit slower for the K, I think. But um, and then all the traces match as well. It's it's yeah yeah. yeah. That's the biggest. Yeah, thing. that's interesting. Yeah, I mean, in the yield enhancement network, we've just done a analysis of all 570 yields that we've had in wheat over the last, well, cereals over the last six years, and some interesting associations coming out of that. Really, that uh, the larger large yields were coming from crops which had slurry applied beforehand, um, and this negative correlation with cover crops. But we need to be careful how we interpret that because it might be not that the cover crops cause the lower yield it might be that they're being used on soils that needed some help with soil structure so they might have already been sort of fields which were struggling a bit with poor soil structure rather than the cover crop actually causing that lower yield so they need to be interpreted properly um as you say ph obviously comes up as important here as, as well and some of the other factors we looked at um wheat variety is important for explaining differences in grain protein but not so much yield interestingly but there wasn't one variety which sort of stood out head and shoulders above the rest but maybe that's because there are just a lot of good varieties out there which um you know a lot there are, they there are do. a lot of good varieties out there and um but again you choose a variety to fit the field yes and to fit where when you think you're going to drill it um and and um, but also more importantly you I do anyway, uh, each to their own, that you choose a, a variety, no matter what uh, enterprise you're growing, cereals, potatoes, uh, beef, sheep, um, whatever, um, you find out what your market is first, and then you grow your crop according to your market. Um, we, we generally have distilling or feed wheats in uh, north, um, to some extent biscuits, um, but um, so we, we grow wheats for that, and then so generally we're soft fours, soft threes, um, and uh, from there, we choose varieties that maybe if they're going into a later field or a later uh, in rotation, say after potatoes, they're going to be better tillering or, or um, a quicker, quicker mm, thing. Yeah. And you look at all these these factors rather than just going straight for yield because there's it's never as black and white as that. Sure. Yep. Yep. That makes sense to me. Yeah. It goes to spring barley as well. Our, our, we used to get some. Some of the older varieties are better tillering, so we put them on the lighter ground and um, to try and uh, conserve the moisture so they'd, they'd go across it before they went up. Um, yeah, it's just it's knowing your ground and putting the right crop in the in the right field. Courses for courses. Yeah, indeed. Easier said than done. Yes, indeed, indeed. Yes. 
Yeah, so some of the other associations we found uh, related to crop nutrition were positive association with fertilizer rate, but you can see it's not a it's not a really steep relationship there. That uh, and then we come to the controversial one, and then the controversial <laughs> one, yes. But uh, <laughs> liquid N was associated with lower yields, and we have seen it also from a a set of French trials from Arvalis as well. So it's not unique. This isn't. But um, we recognise that uh, it's something which does need further validation and we need to understand, you know, why, uh, if it is a real effect. Yeah, I mean, it's really interesting to, to see that and to hear that. Um, I, uh, yeah, as, as we should all do, we should all uh, believe scientists because... Uh, you know, <laughs> <laughs> He's laughing. <laughs> in, a, in a general, general way, uh, worldview as well with, with the disinformation that's going around in the world uh, against uh, scientific research and knowledge but um but saying that uh, yeah I, I i struggle to believe the liquid liquid m is is less especially when you, you look at the whole field application um with the granular application you, you tail off because you you, you don't want to uh, waste or uh, uh contaminate the natural environment round about uh, we want to contain the fertilizer within the field rather than going outside the field. So trajectory of granulars falls off maybe six to three, somewhere between three and six, depending on tramline width, mm. and depending on your spreader pattern um, around the field. Yep. So liquid, you get to the right to the boundary. Um, so you're utilizing the whole field area. Um, Absolutely, much better uniformity of spread mm, of liquid. Uh, yeah. That's that would yeah, be expected. Think, uh, we looked at it and it was about. Uh, or we did a, I did a paper costing for it, and it was approximately ten percent of the hmm. of the of the of the enterprise of that uh, heat enterprise was a uh, headland hmm. and boundary, and uh, it's quite a chunk of your yeah. growing crop that yeah. isn't getting your full application of N. Yeah, no, I hear what you're saying, and it's I think all I'd say is it's something we would like to look at further. Let's say. Yeah, yeah. yeah um, as, as I'm sure the rest of us would as well. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes, I mean, and we also saw some association with greater yields and more phosphate fertilizer, but we didn't see anything interestingly related to potassium, sulfur, or micronutrients. We have to recognize that these are, this is a sort of self-selecting yen group. So they're all farmers who want to push yields a bit. So, um, you know, you need to recognize that when you look at these uh, just, associations. Just looking at the slide just now, it's interesting. It's uh, less uh, for liquid N, uh, harking on back about it, yeah. Uh, is um, less so if S is included, and and mm. uh, I wouldn't look at applying N without S. No. Yeah. Um, yeah. Sure. Um, just as we've gone over previously for maintaining that uh, the N and the S beside each other mm. um, for the growing crop. Mm. So yeah, that's uh, that. That's my, I'm going to hang on to that. <laughs> <laughs> there you should. Indeed. Indeed. Yeah. Yeah. And then, you know, finally on the crop protection front, we were seeing quite a lot of uh, positive association with PGR use, whether that was the PGR is actually increasing yield or whether it was a type of farmer who tended to be, you know, um, maybe more risk averse against lodging and, and wanted to use more PGRs, um, also ended up with higher yields. We don't know. Yeah, I have a real problem with, or a real challenge with PGRs anyway, with being a, a, a large livestock enterprise as well, all the straw yep. required. Yep. So, um, uh, yeah. so we need the straw, we need the straw length, um, but uh, obviously you don't want your crop to fall over either. No. So it's always that uh, weighing up the, the yeah. balance of the two. Yeah. Um, I mean, I work as so many, you don't necessarily see a big straw yield reduction from PGRs, but yes, you get the shortening, but you often get one or two extra tillers, which compensates a bit, and, and you get yeah. a bit of extra sort of um, strengthening of the stem base. So, you know, there's some compensatory factors there. It's, it's timings and knowing yeah. growing crop and sure. uh, good economy. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. So a number of, you know, interesting associations there. Fungicide use was associated. But one of the main things we found was that um, actual amounts of inputs didn't correlate as strongly as we, as we expected with the yield. It was more to do with um, the farm and attention to detail we conclude as being the really critical uh, factor for associated with high yields 
And it's something we really want to get our heads around more is to what is the mindset of the farmer which predisposes uh, that farm to, to getting high yields? Because you can have lots of farms in a similar soil type, in a similar region, experiencing similar weather, but massive differences in in yield on those farms. And that's down to the skill of, of the farmer and the agronomist. So how how is that coming about? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, or, or just pure luck. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I know. I mean, I, I, maybe just uh, just myself. I, I feel uh, weather systems are getting more and more localized uh, as we move forward. Um, yeah. Um, it's it's challenging uh, sometimes. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. It is. It's something we would like to understand better in the future. I must say. Right, Pete. We've got Dan David. We've got a lot of questions coming in here. So I propose we do a quick fire round. Yep. <laughs> um, I'm going to go down the list. Would you increase seed rates for direct drilled cereals compared to the conventional establish establishment techniques in in like for like situations? Hmm. I don't have experience with that, that uh, question. I don't. I mean, <laughs> we, we did this review of um, recently of uh, zero till and whether it justifies autumn end or not. And we did see a few papers which showed that direct zero tillage could result in lower plant establishment. So I suppose in light of that, he might argue that um, you might need to increase the seed rates with zero tillage. If you routinely apply chicken manure, do you need to still apply bag P for cereals? You'd have to do the sums. You'd have to sort of look at the phosphate content of your of your chicken muck and see if it was delivering what you needed to what, to. What, what's your offtake? Yeah, you know, that's it's, right. Uh, it's in maintenance. And, I mean, uh, RB two nine has got the lookup tables that you can standard lookup tables for chicken muck and uh, what the phosphorus content is. But what I would say is that there is a big variation in the nutrient content of different organic materials, and yeah. so if you can uh, test it. The stuff you're putting on, it would be worth doing. Yeah, you're right. There's uh, there's um, there's great ones in the RB209, but also the SARUC does great technical notes. Yep, uh, yep. TN650 for bulk <laughs> organics. Um, uh, they have great tables in the back of them um, uh, that, that, that help um, um, with with all these uh, calculations. And it's quite a even with my own use of FYM uh, cattle FYM. Um, that's a uh, farmyard manure for uh, all the pure arable boys out there um, and girls. Um, but yeah, it's uh, there's there's differences between uh, fresh uh, or middened uh, FYM. So it's um, it, it really is uh, an eye opener uh, using these tables. Yep. Any benefit to placing phosphate at potato planting with reduce with regard to reduced amounts required? Um, <laughs> I, <laughs> take this one. I think because potatoes is such a high value crop, uh, I would be loath to to uh, to suggest it didn't get enough or didn't get more than it needed. Uh, P. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. I bow to David's greater experience <laughs> on this question. <laughs> uh, plenty of people will tell me you, you'd be wrong, probably to to bow to my experience, but yeah. Uh, I, I think um, you look at whenever you're doing any applications to a crop, you look at its potential, you look at, uh, and that's not just its, its growing potential, but its margin potential at the end of the day. We're in business, They're not just to make things look pretty, but we're going to make money out of it. Um, and uh, and if the if the higher margin crops, um, you, you don't skimp on, on, on some of the uh, highly desirable uh, nutrients it needs. Mm, yep. This is in regard to the the um, slide which references some association to biostimulants yep. and, and um, yield increase. There's a plethora of, of biostimulants out there now, so for example, seaweed, amino, amino acids, and phosphites. <coughs> what types are showing some association in your opinion? Well, the, the analysis we did um, we're not able to drill down into, into specific type of, of biostimulant, which 
which was associated with the high yields, it's just general class of biostimulants. And before 2018, the data set didn't show any associations, so you need to bear that in mind. We've done a fair number of experiments in ADAS with biostimulants, and as yet, we haven't seen one which gives a consistent um, benefit. But we do recognise that uh, we have by no means tested all biostimulants in all situations. But uh, that's what we've found so far. I don't know whether David's got any experience with biostimulants. Um, I've tried tramline trials. I've tried fields uh, split half and half with uh, some uh, biostimulants. And uh, I do not see, uh, in, my, in my humble opinion, uh, currently, uh, although not over any great length of, of multiple seasons, I don't see a, a perceived benefit um, that is showable up in a combine yield map. Um, bear in mind there, there, uh, there, there's quite a lot of uh, uh, difference and uh, accuracy uh, with combine mm. yield maps. Yep. Um, so uh, without uh, writing them off or anything like that, uh, it needs further looking at. Mm. I, I see them as an insurance policy. Um, to an extent, especially uh, in, in droughty years, they can be hopefully help the plant um, uh, cope with the stress levels. Um, we, we used them on potatoes this year in the drought to try and uh, lessen the stress on the potatoes as well as uh, some of the cereals. But uh, in some of the lighter ground, it, you, know, you look at the potential of the crop in that in that area and, and thought it's not worth putting that money on the crop. Um, mm look at your return so so yeah yeah right and i call this the final question of the evening do you think we should be moving towards a four-way split for applying the total nitrogen requirement to winter wheat as a standard approach to manage the risk of unpredictable weather events to both of you <laughs> uh, it comes back to what we've kind of covered to an extent um yeah, in multiple approaches, little and often, um, uh, is safer. Um, there's less potential of, of losing uh, uh, some N with uh, with runoff or or, or uh, etc. With excess weather, um, you're you're not giving all the nutrients at once to the growing crop. Uh, but you've got to. Is it? Uh, is do you have the logistics set up to do it? Um, do you have the time available? Do you have the operational window? Or weather-wise, to, to do it, um, these things you can't really uh, do before the season starts. Uh, on paper, it may work, um, but in practice, Mother Nature has her wicked way sometimes. Well, that's right, David. On paper, it should be helpful, but we don't really have much evidence to say that four splits would give you a yield advantage over two splits, mainly because nobody's really tested that question. So I think what, what we'd really like is a bit more evidence to help us make that decision. And I suppose it depends if you're, which market you're going to as well. Um, if you're going for the, the harder wheats, um, they, they prefer a, a later end mm. for, for the for milling. Um, so I'm more used to doing the soft wheats, which aren't, uh, you don't really want to put much end in the head uh, for that. So, so yeah. yeah, yeah, agreed. Any concluding thoughts? What's there before we, before we wrap up, gentlemen? I think we've covered a lot there. Not as bad as I thought it was going to be. <laughs> <laughs> Wait for the feedback, yeah? yeah. <laughs> well, on that note, then, um, it's just gone quarter past eight, and I'll, I'll bring the webinar tonight to, to a, con a conclusion. Um, just to, to reiterate, if you want your basis on the Rosso points, um, please either put them in the notes section or email them to myself, Richard Meredith. You would have received the, the invitation to tonight from me. Um, I just want to thank you both. Thank you for, for the effort and the time that's come to, to put together tonight. We really appreciate it. We've had a huge number logging in and listening. Um, apology for any sound issues at the beginning. We had a bit of a technical issue, but we got once we got going. Oh, that's my accent. No, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we did a translator. We found that you have to plug a laptop in. Yeah. <laughs> <God>. <laughs> well, I find that. Anyway, thank you both. I really appreciate it. Um, if anybody does have any follow-up questions, please feel free to filter them through me. I can contact either of our speakers. Um, but thank you very much and um, have, have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you.